Welcome back, students, summer, virtual, melt you, 2020, and happy 4th of July week. Uh, I'm Vince Thompson, founder, chairman, CEO of Melt, and uh, back for another day's lesson of our Lunch and Learn from my forthcoming book, Building Brand You, which obviously, uh, as time goes on, uh, we're going to talk about the poll today, whether you're going back to school or not, whether or not you're going to go back to football games. Uh, it's going to be more essential to learn these tools, learn these traits, um, you know, as you get out into the job world. We're hearing from just tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, people um, and professionals. I hope that you guys are enjoying those podcasts. I hope that you're learning. I hope that you are uh, re-listening to them. I hope you're reaching out to these people. Tia Cummings from Walker & Company, Bevel Brands, Gary Stoken, uh, Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, Jim Cavale, Influencer, uh, taped an amazing one with Alan Green, the athletic director of My Alma Mater. Shout out today to Auburn, uh, Auburn University. Um, just some tremendous, and we've got some great ones coming up. We taped one with Jim Dinkins, uh, the president of Coca-Cola North America. Uh, we're going to tape uh, Steve Phelps uh, tomorrow, uh, who is the president of NASCAR for careers in auto racing. Katie Bain, my dear friend, Sammy Bain's mother, uh, very hugely successful um, businesswoman, uh, board member, uh, was president of Coke uh, as well. So. Uh, Great, great lineup. I hope you guys are really enjoying this. I really can't believe that we are halfway, almost halfway through. Uh, and we've been talking about how we're going to extend this program beyond the eight weeks. And so I would welcome your thoughts on how to do that. We're thinking about different ways that we can continue to help enhance you, connect you, build networks, uh, build relationships uh, for you. Uh, in a COVID and post COVID world, because uh, it's going to be challenging out there. And, you know, we've talked about that. Uh, we're not going to sugarcoat it as well, but uh, we're here to help you. So um, number four, let's talk about some of our successful alumni. I always like to brag about our alumni uh, before we move into our day's lesson. Our first one is Caleb Davidson and Caleb came to me believe it or not, from the hometown of Chatham, Alabama. And he was a student at Livingston or West Alabama at the time and transferred into Auburn University. And now uh, he is a consumer sales and sports marketing specialist for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, uh, which is owned by Cox Communications. So make a note of researching Cox Communications. They're a giant media company. Uh, radio, television, newspapers, uh, uh, auto trader, they own auto trader, they own Mannheim auctions. Uh, there are huge, they own cable systems. Uh, and so Caleb is a very um, successful executive with their kiosk channel. Kiosk is kind of a fancy word again for activation. I was asked the definition of activation in a uh, podcast I was doing yesterday. And basically activation is putting the batteries in a sponsorship flashlight. So a company buys this very fancy sponsorship, this flashlight, but you got to put the batteries in it to make it uh, uh, shine. You got to make it um, come to life. And so television, radio, in-stadium banners, social media, use of trademarks, licensing, point of sale, those are all under the header of activation. And so um, key advice from Caleb, network, thank you notes. So students, I'm telling you who's going to stand out in this process, during this process, if you will go get yourself some note cards and write per, find out the address uh, of these folks, Tia, uh, Gary, Stoken, et cetera, write them a handwritten note. Tell them how much you appreciate participation in Melt You because they didn't have to do it. They're doing it for free. Drop them a copy of your resume. Stay in touch with them. So Caleb says that was the big, big thing uh, for him. So congratulations, Caleb. Alden Barnett, Burnett, one of my favorite people in the entire world. Uh, her mother is like a sister to me. Her mother's a tremendously famous coach at Mount Vernon Presbyterian School where my son went. I've known Coach Burnett for many, many years. Uh, Autumn Burnett, many, many years, uh, hugely successful volleyball player uh, at the University of West Georgia. But she's parlaying her internship and being a student athlete uh, as a degree in sports management and uh, was a volleyball player, 
making it to the GSC Conference Championship during her senior campaign. Now, this has led to other professional act, uh, activities, including being a student associate for the Georgia Rec Sports Assist, uh, Association, event and ops assistant at the Coliseum of West Georgia, and the events operation intern at the Coliseum this past spring. And so it makes me very proud of Autumn uh, to uh, have watched her grow, watched her become a success, uh, successful young lady, uh, amazing athlete, and how she's parlayed this passion, and this love, and the student athlete. Uh, so, um, and when I met her, she was very shy. And I said, "Look, um, use your performance and your talents you use on the on the court, and channel those into uh, your performance as a professional." And I've just seen her blossom, and uh, it's just a, a amazing. So, congratulations to Autumn and Jack Winchester. Uh, who's one of my faves, uh, was actually uh, been a part of our program for several years, uh, was the uh, paid coordinator last summer. Um, and then, uh, but, but the story of taking the shot. So I'm at Auburn, uh, Auburn uh, producing uh, SEC Nation, working on SEC Nation for one of our clients. And um, Jack walks up to me and says, hey, I'm Jack Winchester. I work over in sports information. I'm a reporter for the Plainsman. And I said, well, that kind of sounds like me. And he knew he already had scoped me out. So, right, he knew he identified the target. Then he came up and took the shot. Then he followed up. It was a model follow-up. Then he did his internship, summer of 18. Then he evolved as a paid intern, summer of 19. Then went to work for the College Football Hall of Fame. Now he's at Engine Shop, um, which is one of our worthy competitors. Uh, shout out to Engine Shop and Ben May Jr., who interned over there uh, as well. But, uh, but again, like uh, a model or a personification for using – me and melt in this program for really 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 what it is and so he says follow up follow up follow up stand out make your voice heard and follow up so uh we hope you enjoyed tuesday gary stoken jim cavalli tomorrow huge lineup google ben sutton the pioneer of multimedia rights uh, business, built a massive business. He has an investment firm now named Teal Capital and within Teal, there are going to be several employment opportunities for you. And then one of my favorites, Shaul Zislin, the founder of one of your favorite music festivals, the Hangout Music Fest. So if you wanna hear some great stories and you wanna understand uh, career opportunities in live music, music festivals, uh, one of the premier in the world, you got to tune in to, uh, to Shaul and uh, a very dear friend as Ben is. And so you're going to get some great advice. And we got a big lineup coming up in the podcast. Mark Charty, prolific Hollywood producer. David Pollack, former UGA superstar, uh, host of ESPN College Game Day, as we talked about, Alan Green, Auburn, Jim Dinkins, Coca-Cola, Greg McGarity, the athletic director of the University of Georgia. A fascinating interview with Craig Silver, who is responsible for putting on CBS SEC football games uh, in the fall. And as I said, Steve Phelps of NASCAR, my dear friend Shannon Watkins, the head of marketing for Applet. And so, uh, but thank you for sharing the podcast. Continue to share them. It's not too late to bring your friends into this. In, into this. Share this with them. Listen, learn, network, follow up. I'm, I'm loving it. Post to social media. Some of the posts you make, you guys, are tremendous. But they're inspiration. They're inspiring others to join our program. They're inspiring others during these crazy uh, and, uh, and difficult times with the hashtag virtual melt you. So um, let's talk about the survey results. And we're going to publish a press release um, today. Our first survey from the commissioned by the melt staff with you. Uh, Melt University students and participants. First question, how likely were are you to attend a college football game in person pre-COVID? Well, that's obviously a no-brainer. 90% uh, said that they would, uh, and 7% would like to watch it on TV. Sometimes I like to do that. And 3%, uh, 28 not likely, didn't care to watch it all. So I'm, I'm really unsure who you are, but uh, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get, we gotta take care of that. But no, I'm just kidding. Everybody has their preferences, and so, um, so that was pre. Okay. So next question: Would you attend a game in the fall of 2020 with the stadium at 50% capacity, 
if attendees are not required to wear, wear face masks. Now, here's an interesting stat. 70% of you said you would without a mask. 20% said you would if all attendees required to, to, to wear face masks. So a um, little bullish, which is a positive. Uh, we know there's a lot of spikes going on. Uh, we know a lot of young kids now, uh, you know, have it. Uh, Carter, my son, UGA, a sophomore, a lot of friends that, that, that have had it, but, uh, but, but, but a little bullish on this. And so we do have a ways to go into Labor Day or into the fall. So how likely would you attend SEC Nation or College Game Day experience in person pre-COVID? 67% said you were likely. 26% uh, not likely, but you would watch it on TV. And it's one of my favorite shows as well, but it never gets old um, to go to that. But how likely would you attend if attendees are not required to wear a face mask? That's sort of a toss up. 36% likely, 38% not likely, 25% would consider if people were required to wear face masks. And so uh, to my dear friends at ESPN, great news out there. If you are considering uh, continuing to consider producing College Game Day live on campus or SEC Nation uh, live on campus as well. And uh, the last question, how likely are you to attend events if there is a vaccine in place? And obviously, 86% uh, said that you would. And 13% are still on the fence a little bit, which I don't think is a, a really kind of a, uh, an uncommon um, reflection. So uh, thank you, students, for participating in uh, that survey. Uh, I'll quote a USA Today article. Students react to colleges reopening with plans of mix of optimism and fear. Uh, my guess is that this is, you know, I think schools are going to be back. Obviously, there's going to be, it's not going to be the normal uh, sorority fraternity rush, maybe the social distancing, maybe the mask uh, and those types of things. But um, I do think this, this, this reflects the positive nature uh, that we all have a belief that we'll be back on the college campuses and, and hopefully that we'll have um, some college football. So today, chapter three, see yourself as the brand, building brand new, chapter three. Can't wait to teach that. Let me pull it up for you really, really quick. So see yourself as the brand. Here we go. Always got my notes with me see yourself as the brand. So as we've discussed, well, let me, let me start this quote with, with Maya Angelou. If somebody shows you who they are, believe them. What do we mean by that? Well, I'm going to answer that a couple of ways. One, um, this entire exercise we're doing is about building brand new what you're showing people, what you're presenting people, how you're auditioning people, how, what you want people to see in you, no different than say Coca-Cola wants people to see in their product, both the functional and the emotional qualities of the, uh, of the product. And so, um, so how you portray yourself is how people are going to see. And we're going to talk a lot about that in chapter three uh, of, the, of the new book coming out in August. Tell your friends about it, building brand you. Chapter three, see, your, see yourself as a brand. So you are the most sophisticated consumer of any generation ever. Why is that? Well, you have access to the information instantaneously, the phone. Uh, you have all of these amazing resources to do your research. We've, we've talked to ad nauseum about LinkedIn. And we're going to continue to talk about uh, LinkedIn a lot as, 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 as a tool. But fortunately for myself, when I came out of Auburn, I probably had published a, a giant portfolio of about 200 articles and had really worked on thousands of events. If you think about 20 to 23 sports on the Auburn campus, men and women, um, for every game that's being played in every practice and every home team and every visiting team and now with the SEC network on the campuses and ACC network, there is a giant functioning support staff behind the athletes on the field. And within that major support staff, there's opportunities for you. And as we've talked to these athletic directors, 
it's been great key learning for me as well because I really had not thought uh, that uh, mental health was an emerging um, uh, career within athletic departments. I, I had not thought through the, the continuing emerging importance of compliance, particularly, and you guys need to Google uh, Greg Sankey from the SEC, who's going to join us uh, later on one of our podcasts uh, later on in the summer, is actually testifying before Congress right now with other uh, athletic players uh, on the issue of name, image, and likeness. That's going to create a lot of other major, major uh, opportunities for you, um, you know, as well. And obviously, we've talked a lot about that that fan experience, that game experience, that student athlete experience in a post-COVID world. And so, um, I was very fortunate to have that experience. And so, I'll continue to encourage you guys. Um, to gain that experience when you go back to college. As we always tell you, the campus is the, uh, the ultimate professional laboratory. And so I also used it as a networking. You know, I was networking with the Craig Silvers of the world, the Paul Feinbaums of the world, the Dick Vitales of the world as well, and you can do that. But, you know, back when I was a student, we probably didn't think about ourselves as a brand. And so one thing with social media dominating the way we communicate, you see this differently. And that's one thing um, that they, we really want to continue to press that right now, you, you, while you're, brand, you, you're, you're a fresh brand, you're, you're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, um, you're building your brand. So right now you have the opportunity to form and shape your brand any way you want it. So as you start this exercise, Think about some of your favorite or favorite famous brands that you know and like, and in your mind, uh, what do they stand for? Nike, performance, you know, back in the old days, you know, want to be like Mike, Michael Jordan, uh, Bo Nose, just do it. That's still their big tagline, you know, just, you know, get up and, and just do it. Uh, so there was a functional message and an emotional message. Apple, uh, technology, but connectivity to the world. Coca-Cola function refreshes, refreshes your, your taste and quenches your thirst, but you share that Coke with a friend and you have that emotional connection. So right now, begin thinking about what your brand stands for. And we're going to talk about that exercise in a minute. We're going to talk about how to begin telling and packaging your brand story. Not you as a person, obviously that counts, but your brand the Melt brand, the Melt You brand, Vince Thompson, the brand, you know, study some of the cues that I'm trying to help, you know, give you uh, as well. So let's talk about beginning to tell and package your brand story. And let's talk about um, discovering your brand and who you are. So everything you do while you're in school, we talked about in the last chapter, okay? But whether you know it or not, every action and activity is a part of the brand building process for you, the building blocks of your brand, the pyramid uh, of the building blocks uh, of your brand. Had I had to go back and do it all over again, unwittingly, um, I think I was building a pretty good brand story while I was there. Love sports, passion, uh, love to write about it, passion, uh, loved who I was covering, the student athletes, really, really loved it, very passionate about it even 40 years later. Um, was proud to represent Auburn, um, had the willingness and desire to do anything that it took to uh, what Coach Vital, you know, wanted a Coke, wanted a cup of coffee or a fine bomb, or he needed some practice notes or he needed some stats ran to him. Um, I was willing to do any of that. So that was part of my brand building. That was the building blocks uh, of the brand. And had I back then, you know, we didn't have the internet, but, but I would have kind of, I would have built a brand board and I, or a mood board. So, you know, old time and go back and kind of clip the magazines out, but go, you know, go on um, uh, some image boards, go on Google images, go on, um, you know, places that, 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 that have images that personify who you are now, what you want your brand to stand for and what that brand destination is. Uh, I wish I could have told you that my brand destination 40 years ago was to build a very successful sports marketing agency. Um, I really, I was, you know, 19, 20 years old like you. I wasn't thinking that far ahead. But had I been in hindsight, 
that would have been my vision board. That would have been my brand board. That would have been my mood or destination board. So, you know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. So build that board and build that destination of who you want to be and what direction are you going in. So um, what are some of those tips? Images that reflect your values, your ideas, your goals, your experiences. Pick out the ones that resonate with you the most. We've talked a lot about passion. What are you passionate about? Sit down and think about that. Sit down and write about it. Uh, ask yourself, like, if it were a perfect world and I could pursue my, my, what my passion is as a profession, profession is a passion, what would that be? And then, and, then uh, and, and even if it's a, a virtual board or a live board, build that board and look at it a lot. And by the way, that board can change. That's okay too. As we said, you know, obviously life's not linear. We're all living through it right now uh, with, uh, with, with COVID. Uh, but but, but it, it helps as a reinforcement, whether it's a subtle or subliminal or overt uh, to know where your destination is. I still do that myself, um, believe it or not, where I want Melt to be, where I want uh, my brand to be as it relates to helping you guys, where I want our business to be, who do we want to target and those things. And, and, and that, that board is going to be um, really what matters to you. That, you're going to be surprised at the emerging collection of images and how they come to life. And so, um, so, that's the, that's the building blocks uh, of your brand. And like I said, uh, it's okay to change it. So then let's talk about how to manage and maintain and grow your brand story. So the way you package and present yourself determines what brand story you wanna tell. But let's step back and unpack this a minute. What is a brand story? So as we talked about, I want you to begin thinking about a different way to package yourself. So what do I mean by that? So if you've been involved in a dance-a-thon or a fun run, anything related to a charity or a cause, that subheader in your resume is participated in successful cause marketing strategy for the juvenile uh, diabetes dance-a-thon that raised a hundred thousand dollars on the Auburn campus. Think about how I just packaged that as opposed to a line that says worked on the JD dance marathon. So step back and unpack those experiences, whether it's a fraternity or sorority, whether you're part of a club, I always use the barista example. You're not just serving coffee. You're on the front line of consumer behavior. You're interacting with consumers. Uh, you're managing order demands. You're working in conjunction and collaborating with a team in a restaurant, the hostess, the server, the kitchen, the chefs, the cook, the bosses, the managers. Uh, you may be helping them with their social media. So, and you might be trying to help yourself work through school. That's a heck of a story as opposed to saying, work two years at uh, Starbucks, for instance or Duncan. So think about how you sort of package and frame that. It's easy if you've been in a leadership position. We talked about, um, I forgot who we interviewed um, this week, but um, he was very involved in the operations of his, uh, his, of his fraternity. And he figured out really, really quick that, hey, I'm pretty good at this operations game. I know how to set a budget, I know how to do sponsorships, I know how to organize meetings, I know how to organize events, I know how to organize our, our meal plan and those types of things. And so, so not only did it say I was X amount at a fraternity, talked about all the responsibilities. It showed leadership, we hear that word a lot. It showed self-starting, we hear that word a lot. We sh it shows initiative, we hear that word a lot. And then it shows the value you'll bring to the organization and how you deliver results because as we say, this is a numbers game and every interaction you have as your brand is an audition um, for that job or that position, what value you're going to bring to that employer because they're going to make a giant investment uh, in you in, uh, in time, money, and resources. Because think about this, without having a proven track record uh, professionally, because you wouldn't have, you've been in college and you're, you're just getting out of college, you got to package what you have done in a very 
attractive and appealing uh, in a descriptive way. I get so many resumes that don't really tell me anything about the person that you are. So think about what that brand messaging is conveying on that paper. And then as we say, the outreach, build some richness into the outreach. Like you've researched Melt, you've researched Vince, you've researched Auburn. Hey, you, you're successful at Auburn. Congrats on Melt, congrats on, on Coca-Cola. It shows me you've done that research. And then, hey, attached is my resume. Attached is a story about my brand. You don't even have to say resume. You may say attached is my brand story that's filled with self-starting initiative and leadership such as X, Y, and Z. So I want you to think about that. I want you to begin uh, practicing that. Let's rename and recoin the term resume to your personal brand story, to your brand story, uh, to that brand story. You're telling that. So let's then talk about brand management. Once you establish a brand, you have to make sure you're reflecting the values of, the, of your brand and everything you do. Like I said, um, it's okay to have fun in, in school. I had a lot of fun. Believe me, I had a lot of fun. I'm thankful there was no social media back then. Um, we didn't do anything out of the ordinary, but, but you know, we, we, were, we, 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 we were students. We had a lot of fun like you do. But now any event or image or environment that you're in can be captured wittingly or unwittingly, whether you know it or not, and can be uploaded, and all of a sudden it's all over the world. So the ramifications of your actions and behavior, and it only takes one, are even more paramount now than they've ever been because one of the first things I'm going to do um, as an employer is I'm going to go look at your social profile. And I'm going to know you're going to be having fun and, 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 and all those types of things, as you should. But, but as we, we talk about, it's the grandma rule. Don't post anything on there that you wouldn't want your grandmother to see because chances are she might see it. So um, those images and those pictures are, you know, will, what we call in the business being off brand. So think about what you want your brand messaging to be, your brand values, your, 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 your brand image, go back to your board, see how you package it, see how you present it, and then look through your social images now uh, to see if anything's out there that's, that's uh, off brand. Of, of, of your aim for your career or who you know you are as a person, because obviously as we say, a picture's worth a thousand words. And so um, you gotta be careful about that. But again, um, don't really freak out too much about that because obviously you've got, you've got TikTok, you've got uh, Twitter, you've got Instagram, you've got IG Live, you've got Facebook, you've got Facebook Live. Um, but you know, like I said, Keep it consistent with your brand. Uh, if you are doing activities on campus, fill those images up with whether you're working on a cause or working at the athletic department or putting a concert on or putting a fun run on. Because I think what I would have been able to do uh, if social media had been around back when I was a student assistant, I would have had some really fun images out there with Paul Feinbaum or Bo Jackson or Charles Barkley or Coach Ty or some of those guys. And so I would be able to build that that brand imagery around that I'm working the event, I'm really having fun at it, but I'm out as a student assistant putting that uh, event together because the social media, I mean, it, it, is a, it is a permanent record. And so right now, while you have the opportunity, not while you're out in the job market, and I'm gonna tell you, there's even gonna be more scrutiny uh, on potential employees going forward because there's gonna be more out there. Obviously we talked about, um, so many people are out of jobs in the marketing services that they're going to be willing to take a lesser job for a lesser salary. And that job may have very well been your first entry level job. So all of these tips of the trade and tricks of the trade that we're talking about today, um, you're going to, you're going to have to, you begin thinking about them. Now you have some time to do that. We're all sort of, you know, at home, uh, or, you know, uh, self-quarantined, you've got time to really begin to get that act together uh, right now. And, 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 and by the way, even, even you see your friends doing that. Those are your friends. Those are your classmates. Um, share this advice with them. Share this, um, this wisdom because you don't want me die tuning in after I see, you know, you have reached out to me and then, you know, some image that's not consistent with your brand or my brand or this organization's brand or how you would be representing the Melt organization's brand or the major brands that we work with because we do work with the major brands and they're going to look and question it too. 
because everybody's looking for, you know, the judgment, what type of judgment are you using in that process? And so, uh, and we represent bonded brands, the Coca-Cola company, Aflac, some of those big ones. And so um, we're going to talk about um, next week. Uh, one of my favorites is really building your, uh, your brand story and imagery on LinkedIn. We've talked a lot about LinkedIn and what I would, what I would encourage you is that, um, of all of the uh, participants that we've had on the podcast, go in and friend them on LinkedIn, go in and thank them and tag them um, or hashtag them on LinkedIn and thank them for their participation. Go in their messages space, thank them for the participation. Tell them a little bit of a, a story about who you are uh, as, a, as, a, as a brand find out you don't have to ask them but just find out through the internet uh what their physical address is and then with your handwritten cards and your and your resume that's that's building your brand displaying your brand shoot them a note and say hey how much this meant to me because i'm telling you um you, you're gonna you're gonna get in that five percentile as we talked about and it's someday you may want to go to work for influencer you may want to go to work for walker you may want to go to work uh for uh, the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, the Coca-Cola Company, and you're going to be at the head of that um, at the head of that class. So, uh, in summary, today, Chapter Three from the new book coming out, Building Brand You. See yourself as a brand. Somebody shows you who they are, believe them, said Maya Angelou, um, and um, see yourself as a brand. Look through the brands that you love and, and, and do a little test. What values within those brands do I like? And then juxtapose that exercise to your own personal brand. So as you discover your brand in summary, um, think about the experiences you've already had at school, how you would describe those on a resume. Go back and rewrite um, your LinkedIn making those descriptions. Go back and repost some images from those experiences. Um, and even if you're not totally clear on that, that's okay too, because don't forget the exercise we talked about. Build yourself a, a brand vision, a brand destination, a brand board uh, that, that begins to talk about who you are uh, and who your value systems are, what your value system is, what's your destination, and begin making that plan when you get back to college, as we say, the college is the ultimate professional lab, uh, because there's going to be a tremendous amount of new opportunities there. You know, working in the venues, working in the fan experience, working with student athletes, the, the, the mental health, the NIL, the compliance, all of these amazing areas. But you got to begin putting the process in place right now, building that brand, putting yourself in position on LinkedIn, networking these people. If you're a student at Auburn or Georgia or Texas A&M, you got a clear path into contacting these guys now. Uh, if you know the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl is going to be played in December and you're from Atlanta or you're on break with friends in Atlanta, you got a clear path to volunteering in that right now and, 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 and pay those dues. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, building your brand story. We talked about the richness, the texture, the contexture, the context of, hey, I'm not just a barista. I'm on the front lines of consumer behavior as well. So, um, and again, uh, let's rename this thing resume. Let's call it uh, your, uh, your brand story. I'd like to share my brand story with you, um, uh, Athletic Director Green, Commissioner Sankey, Mr. Stoken, or whatever. Uh, you're showing that effort. You're showing that initiative. You're showing that stuff starting. And then let's begin talking about the process of the brand man management. Go look through uh, your social media right now. Uh, if there are things on there that shouldn't be on there, um, you know, do away with them right now. If there are things you should put on there, like you were participating in things, put those on there right now and begin that process. Begin identifying what those opportunities are. Begin that reach out right now. It's never too early to begin the, the reach out in the process. And we're going to talk about that more as it relates to on-campus opportunities, intern opportunities, and job uh, opportunities as, uh, as well. So let's go to some questions now. Mr. Thompson, is there any way that you or some of your employees could look at our social media and tell us if something sticks out that there's something an employer wouldn't like to see? Absolutely. I mean, I'll do anything I can to help you. I'm helping, you know, a lot of kids right now. So, um, but again, 
you know, um, I'll help you as well, but also check with some of your friends. Obviously our friends are some of our harshest critics. Check with your parents. Your parents have, you know, likely have jobs and, you know, are employees and employers and those types of things as well. Um, there's a, you know, also a, a, a common sense standard, a smell standard and the grandma standard. Uh, but it, chances are, if you're asking me that right now, you already know there's something on there that you should take down because it's already bothering you and your professional gut or your brand gut as, as, as we would say. So any other, uh, any other questions in the country? Hope that answered it, anonymous attendee. No, today? All right, here's one. Ellie Oldham, Mr. Thompson, is there any way you, you would be able to look at a resume and give tips on how to personalize it? War Eagle, War Eagle back to you, Ellie. Uh, absolutely, we talked a lot about that today. We're gonna to talk about a lot more of the resume building process and, and, and again, and go back and, and watch this one. But you know, if any of you um, want me to take a look at your resume, and I'm actually already taking a look at some of them, um, either hit me up on LinkedIn or email them to me uh, and I'll take a look at them uh, as well. I want to be here to help you because if I can help, I see about a thousand resumes a year. So if I can just share, you know, one ounce of resume and we'll talk about that in, in, uh, in, in, in later chapters, but uh, I'm going to throw you some curveballs on the resume because we're going to talk about a career objective and destination, how important that is. And then I like to build a resume from what I call a reverse uh, inverted pyramid. I never start with the edge. And I, by the way, there's tons of resume formats and styles and fonts out there that are amazing. No more than one page ever. You don't have enough to say in more than one page. I barely do. Inverted pyramid, start with your objective start with your, ex your, your experiences at your school, then start with the, with the uh, education, uh, and then start with both your interests, your accomplishments, and your achievements. And that could be on college and even high school. So if you were uh, the president of your high school, you were an Eagle Scout, you were uh, a, a great student athlete or your valedictorian, that's okay to talk about high school a little bit. But again, think about what we call the inverted pyramid approach to it. So Joseph Thomas spoke about LinkedIn as tools. What are some tips you can, you can give about things you look for as a CEO of Mel? Well, we've talked about that a lot, Joseph. Good to hear from you. Um, the personalization of the LinkedIn message uh, that shows that you've put effort into researching, let's use, use me as an example. If I get a message from you that says, Hey, Mr. Thompson, War Eagle, you're telling me you've researched me. You know, I went to Auburn. Congratulations on the success of Melt. You're playing to my ego um, as well, which means, but you've also, you know, you, you know hey, uh, congratulations on working with Coca-Cola for 20 years. And, and the, here's the other thing. Never attach a resume on the first, first thing. Never do that. Soften the target. Warm up the target. And uh, just to say, hey, I'd, I'd, I'd like to maybe one day reach out to you and share my resume or seek your advice. That's a foolproof tip. If you come to me and say, I'd like some advice, I'm going to respond to you every time because advice is free. I got plenty of it to give. I got time to give it now. And everybody wants to share their advice or share their career advice. So that's a big hook, Joseph, on there. And then about, a, you know, then, you know, a nice thank you back on LinkedIn, hit me on LinkedIn. And about a week or two later say, hey, by the way, attached is my brand story. Would you take a look at it? And in fact, Joseph did that with me the other day and he had a great resume. I gave him a couple of constructive uh, tips or advice and he took it and he's off to the races. So good to hear from you, Joseph. Uh, Dylan Lamb, do you think the college football season will be modified? Shorter season, no fans, et cetera. Um, I think the only promise uh, that I can make you today is I have no idea. Um, it depends on what hour of the day you ask. Last week, I was a little more optimistic than, um, than I was this week because there's so many tests because the kids are coming back. Uh, we're going to see what happens with some of the pro leagues. Um, as I say, if there's no college football, we probably got a larger, greater, greater challenges in society going on right now. Uh, but it, there will be a seismic shift if there's no college football, if there are no kids in campus, um, college uh, athletics and college football funds a lot of the uh, revenue of the athletic departments. 
a lot of donors, a lot of contributors, a lot of alumni, a lot of tickets, a lot of people coming to campus. Uh, my friend Ron Anders is the mayor of Auburn. It'll have a devastating economic impact on the city because those six Saturdays at Auburn uh, make up, you know, 20, 30 percent of their their annual budget. So there's a there's a lot at stake. Um, I would be an advocate for maybe even starting it a little later. Uh, obviously, we get a vaccine. I'm, I'm be a hell of a lot more bullish. Even if we started in October and we played through uh, December, there's a chance the SEC could play in a round robin format. I don't think anybody really truly knows the answer to that right now. Uh, I know everybody has a similar desire, but the main thing is is, is safety, uh, the health and safety of our of our of our players, our student athletes, our coaches, their families, the students. Um, but I, I I think. Short of a vaccine, <clears throat> excuse me, there's going to be a modification somewhere, somehow. Um, but I, I still overall think we have a shot to play. Now, you may not have seen my hot take back in December on Five Bomb, which I, like, I got a lot of grief for. But I said then there was no reason for Trevor Lawrence to play. And I'll give you maybe 100 or 200 million reasons that there are. Um, I'll be shocked if Trevor Lawrence... Uh, plays. I got a lot of grief from a lot of you guys in, in Clemson land um, and um, including uh, Billy Packer and Wes Durham of the ACC network, but um, I still don't think he plays. And I, I'm not sure some of the stars will play uh, because there's just too much, there's too much at, at risk. And now there's even more risk. And so um, uh, I'm not sure I told you, Dylan, what you wanted to hear, but uh, a lot of serious discussions going about it. But the most important thing is the health and safety. Serena Holmes, if we participate in any extracurricular activities at schools, such as sports or clubs, should we include them on a resume? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, it was a great, it, it was a, it was interesting. If you haven't listened to um, Jamel Hester's uh, podcast, or I don't even know if we have it out there yet, but we'll probably have it out there in two or three days. An amazing friend of mine, uh, executive leader at Coca-Cola company. Um, but he worked his way through, uh, University of Tennessee in intramurals. First of all, he's a great athlete. He played many sports. Then he got into refereeing. Then he got into the administration. And then he spent four years building this entire amazing organizational resume uh, through intramurals. And so uh, I hadn't really even thought about that as a career. I played intramurals. I thought it was great. But uh, that's another thing to think about when you go back to campus um, is, you know, any club that you've been in, any intramural sports, not only try to play, but try to assume a leadership position with even organizing the team or the league or the sport or the club. Uh, the emergence of esports clubs is going to be another great opportunity on campus as well. So, yes, include that in the resume, but package it uh, differently than just said, hey, it was a quarterback that, 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 that won the championship. But when Jamel's podcast comes out, uh, tremendous key learnings about um, – uh, how he parlayed his love of sports and intramural sports into uh, a passion and obviously very successful, um, you know, uh, you know, career with the Coca-Cola company and many other fine brands uh, that he had worked for. Griffin Thomas, what's the best way to follow up your original message to an employer if they haven't reached out to you in return? Is it too forward to message twice or does that show a strong desire to work with them? Great question, Griffin. I, for one, like persistence. Uh, two, and you're going to hear this in some of the podcasts, some of us are sort of hiding Easter eggs out there for you to see what kind of effort you're going to be. So sometimes somebody might not respond to you to see if you are going to follow up. Somebody might not be responding to you because they didn't like the style of which you did it. So you need to go back and assess your style. The third thing is, is that sometimes... Uh, some people are better than others about responding and odds are if they don't give you the courtesy of a response, they probably don't match the values that you already have. So that's a red flag already. I try to respond to everybody. I may not tell them what they want to hear, but I try to respond to everybody. And so um, there is a, also a fine line of being aggressive and annoying and that balance of, 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 um, of, uh, of, of initiative. So, but on that first come out, make it brief, make it rich, make it contextual, make it informed, frame it up as advice, 
wait a week to 10 days. Obviously everybody's schedules are upside down with all this insanity going on right now. Uh, and then sort of make a, 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 another pass because some people are better on LinkedIn than others. Some bosses are better than others. Some CEO are better than others. Um, and, and, and by the way, I make reach outs on LinkedIn all the time for new business. And a lot of times people don't, um, respond to me. So, you know, sometimes you just got to keep moving down the road. You know, you don't drive a car out of the rear view mirror, you drive it out of the windshield. And sometimes just take that note, don't take it personal and move on. Um, Jameson Gaddis, do you believe there's a rush or should be a rush to activate NIL for student athletes now more than ever with these athletes health being put at risk, returning to campus and practice? Could you see NIL benefits being approved before the season's played? Um, the NCAA has already said that this will start in January of 2021, but it's not too late for you to begin thinking about building a business plan this fall and within the boundaries and the rules, the athletic department and compliance and all that, beginning to talk to some of these student athletes is like, when this is, the, when this is legal, would you be interested? I actually had a student reach out and he's working on an amazing business plan for just that. So these opportunities are all around you. Um, so this fall is to lay the groundwork and to lay the traps. Maybe pick one or two um, that you might want to um, uh, do a test case with. And then, um, then coming back, hopefully, you know, first of the year, when the flag goes up for NIL, you've laid that foundation, you've laid that, that trap. Now the NCAA is also asking Congress uh, for some federal guidance uh, on NIL, but um, there are some companies, you know, Influencer, you need to follow Jim Cavale. He's on the cutting edge. Uh, there's another guy named Blake Lawrence at Open Doors, O-P-E-N-D-O-R-S-E, -E, that you need to be following. The guy is way ahead of the curve in this stuff. Um, my dear friend Jason Belzer is way ahead of the curve on it. You, you've heard his podcast. My dear friend Michael Schreck is way ahead of the curve on this. Um, a lot of states are passing it. And, and so you also need to study if, say, if you're in Florida, they have a different set of rules than than Georgia, which has passed it, which Alabama is not even passed it as a state yet. So wherever you are also, you got to sort of study the state uh, and, um, and begin laying those, the, those groundworks and, 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 and traps now, because I do think it, you know, nobody's going to really know what the rules are in January. It is a wild, wild west out there. Uh, but, you know, within what you can do now, start building your business plan, your business model and the tools for that. Carson uh, Cockwit, say a shout out to your dad. Hey, Mr. Thompson, can you please touch on how we can illustrate our experience with Melt You on our resume? Curious as to what we should be listing and highlighting. Um, great question. And I'm glad you asked. See, now you're seeking advice. See how I light up when you, when you seek my advice. But first of all, I would position it as virtual um, summer Melt You intern. And um, you can say, you know, uh, was accepted into the program uh, prior to COVID. We all understand as employees, but under uh, participated in intensive eight week uh, virtual training program, listened to 50 podcasts of industry leaders, uh, 10 lunch and learns uh, from uh, Vince Thompson and leadership exercises, including building my brand and so and then within the people that you listen to on the podcast that's your lowest hanging fruit to begin with that's your lowest hanging fruit is reaching out to those people hey mr dinkins really enjoyed your melt you podcast here's i learned so much from you thank you so much attached is my brand story i'd love to be placed in consideration for an internship or job at the Coca-Cola company. So I'm helping you kind of, that, that, that's one of the main takeaways from Melt You this summer is not only you can pad your resume, you've heard from 50 industry leaders, but I'm giving you that lowest hanging fruit to, 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 to listen to. And then here's another thing to extrapolate. Let's say you go to Notre Dame, um, find out who the athletic director is at Notre Dame and say, you know, hey, Mr. Swarbrick, it's Jack Swarbrick. Um, I had the opportunity to, do Melt University extensive program with Vince Thompson. I've interacted with all these athletic directors. I got great advice from some of your colleagues and peers, including Greg McGarity, Alan Green, and Ross Bjork. 
So then you're beginning to make a, a, an emotional connection, a relationship connection, and a relevant connection. And then you say, hey, I'd love to come by and seek your advice. I'd love to come by and understand careers in athletic departments. I understand through my training at Melt U that there are new careers in mental health and compliance and NIL and game day experiences and those types of things. And so weave that tapestry of that story, weave that brand story. Um, and I think that we, we're getting you guys participating in you and share it out there. Because you're getting, and I reshare it, by the way. So we're all getting so many accolades and so many recognition that a lot of people in our industry, particularly sports and events, are already going to be familiar with the with the program because of the breadth of our guests on there. So um, that's why I really have been excited about doing this in a virtual format because so many of you are reposting on LinkedIn and reposting uh, and tagging and connecting and and and, and connecting with. Uh, with the Jim Cavales and the, and the Jim Dinkins and the Tia Cummings of the world. So, um, so I hope that kind of answered it, but I'm giving you a lot of rich things to think about. And, and, and when we repost this, go back and replay this. Cause I think there's a lot of good nuggets in there. Grayson Wyndham, how do you see careers in athletic and, uh, and athletics on college campuses panning out over the next six months, marketing promotions, ticketing out how drastically were their job shift? If let's say fall sports are cut back or postponed completely. Uh, in short term, is I think it's going to be a, a lick, but I am seeing where season ticket sales, particularly in football, are still strong and robust because you got to look at it right now and you got to look at it from the long view because um, maybe somebody's not going to be able to go to Auburn game this fall, but they'll dang sure go in 21 because that, 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 that demand is going to be pent up. But you being the age you are and being the sophistication you are um, – Follow uh, the trend and the evolution of ticketless um, entry into college athletic events because, you know, that's not necessarily even just a journalism degree. That's computer science. It's computer engineering. We've talked about a lot of data analytics careers in the ticket offices examining who that student is, who that alumni is, who that purchaser is, um, what are we going to do to get them back, you know, uh, in um, – uh, uh, IMG Learfield, they do a lot of ticket solutions. Uh, ben Sutton was a pioneer in, in, in ticketing, but it's not just ticketing. Then now it's the electronic tickling, ticketing, but now it's the data analytics behind the ticketing. And then it's uh, going to be more and more important revenue. So it's going to be more and more important to bring those season ticket holders back. Plus those, those also are, tend to be the uh, most passionate donors. So even think about careers and job opportunities within the various development offices on campus. I know at Georgia, there are 300 development officers. Those are fundraisers for those specific schools. So if you went to journalism school or whatever, and then, so, and then the, the broad uh, alumni department as well, because the maintenance of the relationship with Auburn alum and Auburn campus and the donors and those types of things, um, is really, really, is really important. So I will tell you within uh, ticketing, I'm very bullish about the long-term opportunities based on the sophistication of how you know this all goes now because of, of, of your interaction with the phone. Thank you, Grayson. Drew Threlkeld, with the difficulties of post-COVID job market being in an already crammed pool of sports marketers, what's one thing we can hang our hat on to keep from being discouraged? Great question, Drew. Well, first of all, Sometimes it's okay to be discouraged, uh, but don't be discouraged for long. Get back up on that saddle. Secondly, we know sports is coming back. Uh, we don't know how or when, uh, but we know it's going to come back. We know there's always going to be this giant demand for live sports. Eyeballs, television, stream, phones, um, legal wagering, fantasy, in-person, live. Um, so, don't necessarily where we are right now is a snapshot in time. So take the long game here, but spend this time that you have been given as a silver lining. And we're all doing this virtually spend this time building your brand story, building your brand board, building your LinkedIn image, building your social profile image, following up with everybody on the podcast, identifying the targets and the areas and the spaces that you want to be in, because this is going to come back, but also know that the, that the, the, it's going to be a giant numbers game. So right now, begin putting down a list of a hundred targets, a hundred companies 
uh, 100 CEOs or executives within. We've got Tim Zolowski coming on who runs all the revenue for all of Arthur Blank's companies, giant resource coming on. And, and then, the, then extrapolate. So if you live in Denver, for instance, there's a Tim Zulowski in Denver that works for the Broncos and the Nuggets and the Rockies and the soccer team and all that. So it's not necessarily, oh, well, I don't want to move to Atlanta and work for the Falcons. Those similar positions are within all the professional sports leagues, all the college teams, all the universities, and all the major music and event and uh, festivals across the land. So the types of people that I'm extrapolating you to parallel that out to your own personal situation. If you live in Charlotte, there's a bowl game, there's, um, you know, there's the, the NBA team, there's giant NASCAR racing community. You know, if you live in Florida, there's giant opportunities with PGA, LPGA, senior PGA, PGA of America, USGA, and those types of things. So you got to think holistically, vertical and horizontal in this process. But if I'm giving you 50 people, within those 50 people, you should parlay that into maybe a, a, a another 50 to 100, 150 of the types of targets that you want to uh, you want to reach. Because the great news is, long-term sports is not going to go away. A lot of things may go away, but sports is not going to go away. And again, new new and emerging opportunities. Uh, in the esports space, in those types of areas, data analytics, mental health, consumer behavior, compliance, NIL. I think it right now, believe it or not, is the best period ever in history to be in our space because in chaos, there is opportunity. As I told you, I was taking ideas to companies three or four months ago. They thought I was insane. Now they're calling me back going, hey, maybe that's not such a bad idea. So right now for you, is the opportunity to, to really dive in and, 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 and truly, as I said, change is inevitable, growth is optional, choose wisely. One more question, Ali Rubenstein. Hey Vince, during these times, what you say is the best way to navigate a career in the sports industry as a recent graduate? Do you think more companies are eager to hire young folks right out of school or more of the seasoned professionals who have recently been furloughed? Great question, Ali. Um, I think it's gonna be a fine balance. I think, um, I think it's going to make your efforts harder and more challenging to be honest with you, because as an employer, I'm going, all right, first of all, I can't, you know, I've had to furlough a lot of people. I can't afford to bring people back. There are no events and things going on right now are just coming back. And then secondly, uh, there's a lot of good people out uh, in the marketplace and on the street, unfortunately. So what I'm trying to do is, hey, package yourself as powerful as you can. And, and here's another trick. Um, I'm getting a lot of resumes from entry level people. And when they, I will have to admit when they say I'm a recent graduate of XYZ University, I'm sort of segmenting off that versus an experienced person. So in your come out story, you can just say, you know, hey, I've spent the last four years at Auburn University. I've worked on 100 events. I've gained this experience. I'm Even some of the entry-level people, I'm seeing the richness of their stories and the richness of how they're packaging themselves, uh, not just to call out, I'm a recent graduate, because that, that doesn't really bring any value to the brand story that you're trying to tell me to convince you uh, for me to hire you. But if you come in and say, hey, I've spent four years in Auburn University Sports Information. I've written 200 articles. I know you guys are a sports marketing firm. I know my ability to communicate. I know my ability to navigate this landscape will bring instant value to the organization. That's a complete different spin in packaging than just say I'm a recent graduate of X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and I wouldn't advise you to say that, you know, anyway, even in, 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 in pre-COVID. But um, I do think it's, you know, again, that's why I'm also trying to point out where the new opportunities are. Uh, and here's another tip for our listeners. Every marketing services agency and sports event and sports team in the country, we're all going to have to do things totally different. This ain't the, this ain't the old days anymore pre COVID. And you as the most sophisticated consumer in the world can lead that effort. So talk about the value that you bring to an employee knowing even by the way, even if, if you goodness knows had COVID and you recovered, you've been through that experience of the testing and, and all those types of things. 
there's so many ways to make the connection now because I know as Melt and Auburn and everybody else, we're going to have to do things a heck of a lot different than we did, you know, uh, in March. And so figure out a way to, 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 to package and present yourself, um, not just as quote unquote, a recent, a recent graduate. So again, it's all about building brand new. It's about communicating the story, of your brand, position, your brand, and how you can add value to that organization. And you've done that research on the organization and knowing that you're a sophisticated consumer as well. So, um, this has been a tremendous session. Uh, I can't believe that we are uh, halfway through the program. I appreciate all the tremendous comments. Keep the comments coming, cards and letters coming, repost coming. Uh, share with your friends, encourage your friends to come on. Follow up, network, LinkedIn, build a brand. Um, you, you, you're going to have to hustle. It's going to be it's going to be crazy, but. Uh, um, I really appreciate you know all your participation so far. It's been an amazing, amazing thing, and and, and we got a tremendous back half of the summer coming with some tremendous guests on the podcast. So, thank you so much. I hope you have. I hope all you guys are staying safe. Uh, have a happy and healthy Fourth uh, of July. I'm Vince Thompson, founder, chairman, CEO of Melt Virtual Summer 2020 Melt University. We roll on. <laughs>